Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Margaret Lynch. I'm the executive director of the Irish American Archives Society in Cleveland, and I'm going to talk to you today about the impact of the Tuke immigration scheme with an emphasis on Cleveland. Uh, it's long been known that there's a strong connection between Cleveland and County Mayo, especially Ackle Island, Ackle Parish. Um, we have an active Mayo Society in Cleveland. Cleveland and Ackle are twinned communities. And as executive director of the Irish American Archives Society, which focuses on the history of the Irish in Cleveland, I've been looking into the nature of those connections and the background for them. I became aware of the significance of the Tuke scheme for Cleveland as I started to hear about the work of the Heritage Center in Aklim on the Belmullet Peninsula. Um, I began to be especially interested when I began to understand that the um, the Tuke immigration scheme affected communities ringing the entirety of Black Side Bay. So that meant uh, Ackle as well as um, communities on the Belmont Peninsula. I started looking at the, I found and started interacting with the website Black Side Bay Immigration. Ie, um, extremely important resource for all of those interested in this topic. On the website, uh, we can find the um, results of the transcription of all of the passenger manifests for all of the sailings that left from Blackside Bay. The transcriptions were done um, by Rosemary Garrity uh, for the main part. She took the lead on that and also on uh, populating the website, um, which has a searchable database and a mechanism for crowdsourcing information about passengers, primarily from descendants. I corresponded with Rosemary. Um, she and a delegation from the Heritage Center came to Cleveland in 2015. Uh, one of the institutions I took them to to visit um, was John Carroll University, a local university here. And in spring of 2016, I um, launched a annual um, spring internship, research internship with John Carroll University History Department students. Our goal would be to find the two passengers, especially those bound for Cleveland, but we soon realized that we had to um, find all of them in order to make sure that we had those who were actually ended up in Cleveland. Our research to date has yielded information on six sailings. Um, we have a lot to go, nine to be exact. Um, but we're beginning to be in a position where we can begin to add up some of the research, consolidate it, um, figure out how to share it um, in a way that will aid family history researchers as the website Blackside Bay Immigration does, but also future historians. If you look at the website itself, there's a lot of information about James Hack Took, the background for the scheme, and also this Took sailings that left from Black Sod Bay. Um, there are more than 3,000 passengers chronicled on this website. Um, they came to, the, to North America in 15 sailings in 1883 and 1884. On the website, the passengers are grouped by sailing on the um, homepage, and then within each sailing, they're grouped by sailing party and each sailing party has a page on the website. A sailing party is a group of people that travel together, usually family group. Um, and for each sailing party, there's some information if it's known, and that includes the townland of origin, where they came from and where they stated on the manifest that they were going to. Um, the, um, there's also information about the passengers. Um, the names and ages and gender are on the passenger manifest. So that information is also directly on the website. You can also have crowdsourced information. Um, as this page does, um, there's a picture of one of the passengers on the page, Dennis Ginley, probably the head of this sailing party. Um, there could be other information added by, by um, descendants if known. Um, through the searchable um, aspect of the website, you can find, uh, you can search the destinations and find that um, Pennsylvania and Ohio were the leading destinations given by the passengers on the manifests. 
As we started researching them, we're looking for individuals, but we realized quickly that we're looking for them. They're often staying, to, they're leaving in family groups and they're often staying together or, and, and usually at the outset there, they're found together. Um, so we're tracking individuals and family groups and we begin to, um, we're, we're following the lead of the Blackside Bay website about what a family group might be. Um, the site takes a stab at defining those. Um, most of the, some of the uh, manifests bracket each family group together, but most of them don't. Um, so it's an educated guess as to what a family group might be. Uh, and we're the Blackside Bay Emigration website is a starting point, as I said, but research can suggest conf refinements to that understanding of what a family group might be. For example, on this manifest, um, we have a couple, an older couple, Michael and Margaret Cordoff, an unknown individual woman, Kate Moore, and then a, a group uh, headed by a woman named Bridget Hogan and um, several children. In Bridget Hogan's death record in the United States, we find that her parents are named Michael Cardiff and Margaret Joyce Cardiff, and therefore these people in the passenger manifest ahead of her are undoubtedly her parents, we haven't established who Kate Moore is. Um, we could regard them as a family group traveling together, but because Kate Moore is in the middle and we haven't identified her relationship to them, um, but also because they don't actually end up in the same destination in the United States, we make the decision that family relationships don't always match up with destinations. So for us, um, the definition of a family group became people related as a family, um, plus an interrelated trajectory in the, in the US or North America. That is to say that they're going to the same destination together. And we did find many, um, instances where there is a sort of a trailing older woman at the end of a family group and often found out that this is a mother or mother-in-law of the family and um, were able to associate them um, and they did end up going in the same direction uh, to the same location with the rest of the family and therefore we define them together as a family group. Um, as we're doing the research we had to figure out ways to um, memorialize it, gather it together, organize it. And we developed two um, important um, vehicles for that uh, tracking of the research. Um, the first is that for every sailing party or family group, as we might call them, um, we're creating a Word doc that we're calling a finders document. Um, we're looking for our people in public records available online. These are mostly record uh, online sources that cater to people doing family history research. And um, they become quite sophisticated and most of them have uh, search reports that they deliver um, that kind of summarize the document. And we copy the entire search report into a um, Word doc. Um, not only does it give us an informa information about the people um, who are listed together in whatever public document, it might be in this case, a census record, but often information is summarized such as whether they can read and write, how many children um, were born to a mother, how many, were, how many children were still alive. Um, so there's quite a lot of information. The finders documents become quite lengthy because we're um, including the documents for every every individual passenger in that group, come up to about 40 pages sometimes, sometimes more. Um, so we needed another vehicle to sort of do a higher level summary of the information. And we've developed spreadsheets for each sailing. Um, started out with a limited number of fields that we were tracking and soon realized that um, we just began adding more and more fields. Now we have upwards of possibly a hundred fields or information that we're tracking um, and creating um, searchable, sortable databases for. Um, so we've got six sailings so far, as I said, these are the sailings that we've done. Um, five of the six were headed to Boston, the uh, one of the primary locations or destinations of the two sponsored sailings, but one was going to Quebec, the other um, 
stated destination of the Tuke sailings. Um, these six sailings account for 1,500 passengers roughly in 324 sailing parties. Um, we found 46% um, of the sailing parties in their stated destination when there was a stated destination. Um, we found another 18% in another destination. We don't know, haven't been able to document whether they went to their original stated destination first and then detoured quickly or whether they never went to their destination at all. Um, about We have a, found that there's an average of about 25 20.5 percent uh, rate of can't find, never find. Um, there's also sort of a um, a smaller gray area of people that we've possibly found but can't um, identify with absolute certain with as much certainty. So here's some of the basic demographics that we're finding in those six sailings. There's slightly more women than men. 53.5 percent women. 46.5 percent men. Um, most strikingly, more than half the passengers are 18 years of age and younger. Um, very young boat, um, including 60 infants over that, over those six sailings, some as young as two days old. Imagine traveling on an ocean voyage with a two-day-old infant. Incredible. Um, less than 1% of the passengers identified themselves as more than a uh, as older than 60. Um, that might not be entirely accurate because uh, we find that uh, older people in particular weren't too um, precise about date of birth. Um, but even so, um, it, you can see that the um, demographics of the um, sailing shifted or skewed very young. Um, so it wasn't surprising to find out that many of the young families on these sailings continued to have children after they settled in North America. And uh, we also began to find out that um, the very youngest passengers weren't dying until fairly recently, within my lifetime, certainly. Um, the last identified death year that we've been able to find so far is 1985. Um, so, uh, all of these demographics point towards um, the fact that there were a lot of uh, families on these boats with younger children. And then we began to look at the family makeup and found that indeed 50% um, of the uh, sailing parties were what we today would call a nuclear family with two parents and children. Um, there was another 22% consisting of single parents and children. Most often the single parents were mothers and about almost a third of those were people who were later re re reunited with a spouse. In other words, they weren't widowed, um, but their spouse had gone on ahead um, to North America to get settled before the um, family came and joined them. The emphasis on um, families with more than 72% of the passengers grouped in what some kind of family with a parent and children um, accords with the goals of the Tuke um, immigration scheme. Um, there's uh, a line from the uh, report that Tuke and some of his um, assistants published at the end of the first year, uh, at the end of the 1883 year. Um, that said, I made it also a rule in case of families that the whole family should go or none. Um, so that is reflected in the um, statistics on the family. Um, and in addition to the sort of traditional family group, you have 11.5 um, in other configurations like group of siblings or other relatives, but you do have 16.5% of the passengers traveling, seemingly traveling alone, or at least we have not yet been able to figure out what their relationship is to the other people around them. And those tra passengers traveling alone account for a great number of the majority of, shall we say, of the can't find um, category <clears throat> because there's no context, um, nothing we can associate them with and making that, that all makes it very difficult to identify them with certainty in North America. Um, the mean and average family size sort of coalesce around the number six, and that usually includes two parents and four children. The departures um, 
from the um, Black Sod Bay um, reflected people coming from four civil parishes surrounding Black Sod Bay. And in the Tuke report, there's a map that sort of indicates um, in this sort of khaki green color on um, the areas that Tuke originally proposed to um, assist. Um, the actual areas um, became a little more um, adjusted as time went on, and he did assist people in this um, area along the edge of the bay um, in um, Kilcommon Parish, and uh, the assistance went to communities a little further away from the um, from direct access to water. But most communities were those that had direct access to water because they had to get to the um, sailing vessels at anchor in Blackside Bay, and many of them came out in cracks and smaller vessels, hookers, for example. Um, a third each, almost a third each, came from the two parishes, civil parishes in the Belmola district, the Kilmore Parish and the Kilcommon Parish, Kilcommon Parish, sorry. Um, about 15% include people that we couldn't identify their townland of origin. And the rest came from Ackle, 17%, and the smaller group from neighboring Burschel Parish at 8%. Um, the townlands, um, a good portion of the townlands from the 1883 sailings were identified in the Tuke report. Um, I think that Rosemary has done additional research and added um, townlands for uh, others on the Black Sod Bay website and our research um, uncovered um, probable townlands of origins for others. Um, so we found departures identified from 94 townlands in those civil in those four civil parishes. Most of those townlands only had one or two families leaving, but departure numbers are related to family size. So that could include a family size of 12, 10 children and two parents on occasion, leaving from an individual village. But when we stack up the um, townlands that had five families or more leave, there were nine townlands and it really has struck us that some of the townlands were really emptied out, some individual townlands, um, especially Tala in the Kilmore Parish, the Valley in the Ackle Parish, Dula, um, Kilcommon, also Ag Agaglashin or Tip in the Kilmore Parish. 86 people from 17 families left from Tala. Um, just imagine that number of people leaving over a two year period um, would really empty out a small village. Um, some of the passenger manifests asked the passengers for their intended destination, um, but others, um, but some didn't supply the information or some of the passenger manifests did not include that information. So when we're looking at confirmed destinations, those are destinations where we feel that we've actually found these people. And we found three groups returning to Ireland. That happened occasionally. Um, one of our sailings landed in Quebec and we found six family groups staying in Canada. Um, but most were found in the United States across scattered across 21 states, mostly um, very rarely, if any, very few, if any, settled in states, mostly in Northern states. Um, and the indication that you get from the um, doing a searchable data um, search on the website for intended destinations kind of forefronted the importance of Pennsylvania and Ohio. And that is borne out by our research of confirmed destinations. Ohio and Pennsylvania have the lion's share of sailing parties by far. Ohio 23.5% and Pennsylvania 21%. The closest next states are Massachusetts and Wisconsin with 10, per, with 10 sailing parties each, which translates to only 3% of the total of sailing parties on those six ships. So Ohio and Pennsylvania are strong um, preferences among these people. Um, and if you stack up counties um, as uh, 
instead of states, um, that prevalence is maintained. Cuyahoga County, where Cleveland is located, is the top destination among all county destinations. And Lackawanna, Pennsylvania, with um, the large city of Scranton, is the next. And Schuylkill County in Pennsylvania, the next. And that's a coal mining region, doesn't have a lot of large, doesn't have large towns, a lot of smaller um, coal mining towns. Um, so I've kind of begun to mention coal mining here, and um, I won't go really in depth into Pennsylvania um, per se, but most of the Pennsylvania destinations are in four coal mining counties. And so it's clear that the um, prospect of coal mining um, drew people to those counties. Um, what drew them to Cleveland, transitioning to Cleveland now? Cleveland had a more diversified economy already in the 1880s. Steel making was um, quite an engine um, for Cleveland's economy, but it, there were a lot of attendant or related industries, iron ore docks, railroad, it was a railroad center and a shipbuilding center. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity, plenty of opportunity for work here, particularly for unskilled um, laborers, manual laborers um, requiring no um, particular education or skills, which was fortunate for this group of immigrants because they had neither education or skills. Um, however, there were some challenges that, the, um, that they might have met in the 1880s, um, which include, there was a major labor, year-long labor strike in one of the steel mills in 1882, and unrest, a labor unrest in the steel mills lasted throughout the rest of the 1880s as well. Um, this had a particular impact on the distribution of settlement in Cleveland, which I'll explain in a minute. But first, I want to point out that another reason for immigrants, two immigrants, um, to come to Cleveland was more personal. Some of them probably had relatives here already. There was an earlier wave of after immigration to Cleveland in the 1860s that was particular to um, bad weather and growing patterns specific to Ackle. Um, the immigrants who arrived in the 1860s and their friends and families that trailed behind them in the 1870s um, settled primarily in two neighborhoods in Cleveland. One was called the Angle and St. Malachy Parish was its um, sort of founding or um, foundational institution. Um, and the other neighborhood was Newburgh um, with Holy Name Parish being um, the center of, of um, settlement there um, for most of the Catholic immigrants coming from Ireland. Uh, so um, 1860s and trailing immigration into the 1870s, those people were recent enough for the 1880s immigrants to have a sense of connection um, with either family or um, friends, neighbors, fellow townland folk, and that helped bring some of the Tuk immigrants to Cleveland as well. Um, given the earlier fairly even settlement between Ackle, between Angle and Newburgh in Cleveland, you might expect that the same thing would happen with the Tuk immigrants. However, it doesn't. Um, the settlement to Newburgh um, is far less than the settlement in the Angle. Um, we have tracked um, addresses and street names in the 1900 census in Cleveland. And this is kind of a rough um, picture because you don't find every single person in the census. Some can be found in other records in other ways, but we just chose to look at the street names in the census. Some people died before 1900. So it's not um, a super precise kind of picture, but it does give a rough idea. Um, we're um, imposing small numbers on a um, ward, 1898 ward map of Cleveland that sort of corresponds to um, the 1900 census. And we find that only um, 29 of the addresses are, um, can be um, tied to the ward that includes um, Newburgh and the steel mills whereas far more can be found up in the neighborhood called Angle. The Angle is split into two wards at the, um, at the time of 1900, um, yielding about 
130 people, um, but earlier St. Malachy Parish encompassed all of the um, people living around on uh, the river whose crooked path is uh, right here. This is the Cuyahoga River um, and its native uh, word meaning crooked river. Um, so um, all the people living along um, this river uh, near the top of the river belong to St. Malachy's Parish. So if you add the people in this ward in, you've got almost 150 people. Um, who settled originally in St. Malachy's Parish. And you also see not only that dense settlement um, close to the river and in the wards closest to the river, but you also get um, by 1900, the beginning of movement out from those central or original neighborhoods um, along main arteries um, and particularly along the lakefront, you get another 36 um, people living in the um, ward next over from the um, southern part of the Angle neighborhood. So many more of the immigrants are settling in the Angle neighborhood and adjacent neighborhoods rather than in Newburgh. And I believe but cannot prove that it, it's related to that labor unrest in the steel mills, which um, the steel mill owners blamed on the Irish workers and therefore were reluctant for a time to hire Irish workers and in fact shut them out, locked them out for quite a while in the 1880s. So I think that skewed people towards or shifted people towards the angle where they could find work in the um, iron ore docks, um, the railroad yards and shipbuilding yards. Um, it's not surprising then that one of the um, primary um, documents that seems to refer to this influx of immigrants in the 1880s, comes from St. Malachy Parish, the church that served the Angle neighborhood. It's a report delivered to the diocese in 1884 for the year 1883, and recall that the ships came in 1883 and 84. Um, the pastor's trying to justify the fact that there is a large number of non-paying families in the parish that year, not contributing to the upkeep of the parish at all. And he explained, and I quote, the number of poor immigrants that settled here last year was very great. This undoubtedly refers to the influx of Tuke immigrants in um, the Angle neighborhood in Cleveland. Um, the topography of the Angle neighborhood in Cleveland is such that um, it uh, starts on high ground but slopes towards the lake and the river. The gently sloping part of the angle had previously been settled by the 1860s and 1870s settlers. So the only available um, place to settle was the steepest incline um, towards the lake, the area where there's area of steepest incline. There was a, a triangle of three streets um, that many of these in, incoming immigrants um, crowded into. Um, with hastily slapped up housing of poor quality. Um, so the terrain was um, steep, it was crowded, narrow lots, poor quality housing in a highly industrial area. Um, the uh, nickname Triangle was shortened later to Angle. Although there was lots, there was work there, um, it was uncertain employment because many of the, much of the employment, especially on the iron ore docks was employment as day labor. That meant that there was no guaranteed um, salary, work was paid, work was contracted, if you will, not, not an actual contract, but a verbal contract on a daily basis. And you only got paid for the days that you work and recall that um, Cleveland has a long, harsh winter or can, um, and there might not be any work at all during the winter months. So despite the fact that there was work, um, there was still a, a high level of poverty in this neighborhood. Um, many of the um, immigrants came with a low level of education already. Um, so there's a lack of education and high mortality rates in this neighborhood. Um, from about 1890 on, when some of the youngest um, two uh, passengers were sort of beginning to come of age, if you will, um, the neighborhood began to be associated in newspapers with brawling, drinking, and gang activities, um, negative imagery that we would later associate with today with um, the concept of a ghetto. 
And indeed, some of our, our two immigrants did get involved in some of that gang activity. Um, there was a family of, uh, that included sons Patrick and Michael Gorman. They also had some cousins who were on there uh, and they were on one of the two sailings, the 1883 Austrian. They had some cousins on that sailing as well, who also became involved in the Triangle Gang when they lived, when the family lived first in the Angle. They moved out to the neighborhood um, further west and uh, the two brothers became involved in um, something called the McCart Street Gang and they engaged in petty theft for the most part, but had some run-ins with the law that led to um, time in the penitentiary. This is Michael Foxy Gorman's uh, mugshot um, taken at the penitentiary. Uh, Michael was 12 years old um, when his family arrived on the SS Austrian in 1883. But most of the two passengers were law-abiding citizens and those crowded conditions in the angle um, led to mutual um, dependence and community building. And you could often find um, two families in close proximity with each other in the census records for the Angle neighborhood. In the 1910 census in Cleveland, um, you find four households um, that are listed in a row on the um, census sheet. Um, they're living on Vermont Street in the Angle. And those four households include, each household includes individuals with connections with the um, 1884 Canadian sailing, including nine passengers and numerous children born um, in the U.S. to those families. Almost all the households were multi-generational. They included widowed mothers, unmarried adult children, and the husbands of married, husbands and children of married daughters. Um, so the picture that emerges um, is uh, often of people sort of um, sticking together and presumably mu mutually um, supporting and helping each other, though some scatter um, off in their own directions as well, of course. Um, we start, as we do the research, um, we start uncovering um, how interconnected many of the passengers are, it's sort of a maybe a bewildered, <laughs> bewildering diagram here, but I tried to sort of map out um, uh, how uh, one particular, we looked at one particular family and began to find um, that you had uh, children of the same parents, Owen Haney and Sibby Cooney, who lived in the Valley in Ackle. And they had at least six children that we've identified so far on three different sailings. And those are the people in the um, black boxes here. Um, and uh, they, these people did not come to uh, the US on their own. Each of these people had a family with them. So we're expanding the number of people, um, always expanding exponentially the number of people who might be interconnected. And each of them had further connections with people on other sailings, frequently in-laws, who also came on other sailings. I won't go into all the details, but those interconnected people on other sailings are in the green boxes. Um, in the case of Margaret Haney English, one of her adult sons came on another sailing, um, Edward English, and he um, expanded that web of connections by marrying one of his fellow passengers, um, Ellen Madden, after he came to Cleveland. Now, all of these people and their families um, came to Cleveland, and most of them stayed here except for this small group of McManaman in-laws of Michael Haney, um, who came to Cleveland at first, but um, followed an older sibling um, to Nebraska. That older sibling had already been in Nebraska for about a decade, and many of them decided to try a farming life in Nebraska um, rather than um, brave uh, the industrial uh, landscape of Cleveland. Uh, but you can, um, this is just one family. <laughs> there are many um, interconnections that we're discovering all the time. Um, we've, be, we've tracked the occupations of the um, passengers that we've been documenting, but in order to really do um, higher level analysis of their occupations, we need to um, sort of um, standardize 
um, those occupations, uh, put them in some kind of standard form. Haven't done that for all of the passengers yet, but anecdotally, most of the two passengers, um, particularly the older ones, will have taken laboring jobs when they come to the um, to North America, and uh, sometimes um, very younger family members um, who grow up and are really schooled in um, North America, or family members, younger children born in. Um, the U.S. Um, might take on occupations such as um, clerk, a clerking occupation that require a little bit more education. Um, it's not to say that um, the children on the um, Tuk uh, sailing couldn't read or write. Many of them could, though many of their parents could not. Um, but um, they um, sort of, as many incoming um, immigrants do, kind of fun first into laboring jobs. Um, we were looking at a picture of a um, Gannon family that came to um, Cleveland on the 1884 Canadian, a large family group already um, with two additional children born in the U.S. Um, the occupations included um, digging ditches for the gas company, um, serving as a fireman, working in the blast furnace in a, in a steel mill, working on the railroad, an iron worker, um, and yet, despite those laboring occupations, they chose to gather in 1915 in a very refined and dignified way to take a studio portrait of themselves um, to convey their aspirational, um, uh, as aspirational qualities. And many of the photographs um, shared on the Black Side by Bay Emigration website um, have this same aspirational quality to them. Uh, in um, investigating these people, um, we found out um, a, a lot about what became of them here. And in particular, um, we found some with who have made very notable contributions. Probably the most famous Tuk descendant is, um, or Tuk adjacent um, individual would be boxer Johnny Kilbane. Um, his father actually did not come on the Tuk immigration scheme. He came um, from Ackle Parish a few years before, um, probably as a result of the pressures of the Forgotten Famine, which um, began to um, take hold in 1879, and that's about when he came here. On the 1884 Canadian sailing were Johnny's grandmother, an uncle, and a group of cousins. The family lived in the Angle, went to St. Malachy's Parish. It's there where Johnny learned how to box. In 1912, he became World Featherweight Boxing Championship and held the title for 10 years. Um, two descendants have made um, a variety of, of marks in Cleveland. Um, uh, we've got a family um, that's memorialized in the name of a prominent community center here, the May Dugan Center. Uh, family very involved in uh, founding the West Side Irish American Club and supporters of St. Coleman's Church. Um, the uh, another important Irish parish in Cleveland, um, a Conway family who was very involved in building um, the city's first um, grocery store chain, um, the Fisher Brothers, and another family involved in um, a group called the Irish Civic Association and um, the organization of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, their name is Lynch and distantly related to me. Um, and we're finding new um, connections all the time. I just found a, a group that of Corgan uh, passengers. There were three, three sailing parties within one um, sailing and uh, among their descendants, a multi-generation family of judges in Cleveland. Um, so uh, in looking at these, the, the families, um, we're tracking indicators for literacy, employment, economic improvement, social standing, marital status, um, but really sort of making um, observations about any of these topics um, takes a lot of work and effort. Um, we've just begun that. We kind of are putting, uh, assembling the building blocks for that analysis. Um, so a real analysis of the impact of the TUC scheme would take a lot more work um, uh, to answer, to, to look at that in detail. 
And we're also conscious of the fact that at the end of the day, the, out, the outcomes for the people who came to North America probably need to be compared to the outcomes of the people who stayed behind because part of Tuke's intention was to um, enlarge the holdings, get people to leave um, so and give their land to um, family members and friends and neighbors um, so that um, the holdings of those who stayed behind could be enlarged. Um, so that's another whole large um, area of research that we haven't attempted yet. But each semester, the students that I work with um, do a PowerPoint presentation for the faculty at John Carroll, the history faculty, um, and take a stab at um, making some observations on such topics as literacy and employment, et cetera, um, for that sailing um, for the group of people that they personally have researched. And um, one of our students, um, a JCU graduate, has gone on to do a master's um, degree at James Madison University, and she chose to do her master's thesis on the 1884 Canadian Tuke sailing and um, an, and an online exhibit is the format for her master's thesis. Um, she's pictured here, Erin Kelly, and we're um, very proud of the work she's done to continue um, exploring um, some of these sailings in greater depth. So um, Aaron's not the only student who has worked on this. Um, there's a group, uh, at least one a year um, for all these six years. Their names are here. I won't name them all right now, um, as some of them have uh, contributed additional work outside of their original internship to help populate those spreadsheets. Um, there's been about four of them and I especially want to thank them. Um, we've also relied on um, information uh, contributed to the Black Side Bay Immigration website, and also um, people who have contributed family trees to Ancestry and Family Search, for example. And we try to capture and copy that information into the um, family finders documents, um, accrediting those sources when we um, find them. Um, they, they have often... Um, provided the crucial key to finding um, people that we wouldn't find without their without the information that they've already shared. We'd especially like to thank Rosemary Garrity, um, who did all the transcriptions of the uh, original manifests and continues um, to research um, all of these passengers um, herself. And um, it's her um, passion for recovering information about those two passengers and their stories um, that is, has been the starting point for our work um, in Cleveland and will be the starting point for any future study for a long time, I think. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for listening. Hope I uh, provided you with a little insight into um, the impact of the two immigration on Cleveland, but there's a lot more work to do. Thanks. <laughs>